The Principle of Hope by Ernst Bloch, Volume 1, uh, Chapter 7. What is left to wish for in old age? In old age, we learn to forget. Exciting wishes recede, although their images remain. They picture escape, as they once did in March. The young girl in dangerous old age, the flashy teenager in the old fop, can share a turbulent desire for new life. Nevertheless, we no longer yield so willingly to temptation. Even if the wish does not wane, the strength which thinks itself capable of fulfilling the wish does. Even if the strength does not wane, then the disappointed gift of picturing ahead does. To this extent, and often only to this extent, unrest decreases. Wine and Purse Instead, the realistic fears increase. They want to be avoided. The body does not recover so quickly as it did. Everything is twice the effort. Work does not go smoothly. Economic uncertainty weighs heavier than before. Needs in the form of addictions. Those whose satisfaction does not bring pleasure, but whose absence causes pain, do in fact decrease. Yet instead the demand for comfort increases, and to a grumpy old man, everything can become uncomfortable, even what he used to, even what he is used to, but even more so what is new. The adolescent is at odds with the ordinary environment and declares war on it. The grown man applies his strength to it, often resulting in the loss of his dreams, of his previously better consciousness. But the elderly man, the old man, when he gets annoyed with the world, does not fight against it like the adolescent, but stands in danger of becoming peevish towards it, moaning and cantankerous. At least in those areas where the old personality turns sour, where it simply shrinks back into miserliness and selfishness. In bourgeois old age, money seems more desirable than ever, both on account of the neurotic drive to cling on to things with wizened hands, for which a means has entirely become an end. And of course, also on account of the mortal fear of an infirm being. Wine and purse remain for petty old age what remains to be wished for, and not always only for petty old age. Wine, women, and song, this association dissolves. The bottle lasts longer. Cheers, old boy. That is why an old drinker seems nicer than an old lover. Evocations of youth, counter-wish, harvest. Even young people, indeed especially young people, wish to live for a long time. But this seldom includes the wish to be an old man. This is rarely indulged. An adolescent can imagine himself as a man, but hardly as an old man. The morning points to midday, not to evening. It is remarkable in itself that getting old, insofar as it relates to the loss of an earlier state which, whether rightly or wrongly, is felt to be better, is not really felt until around fifty. Does the adolescent feel no loss at leaving his childhood behind? Does the man feel none when he quits the bloom of youth, when the green shoot turns to wood? Does the child not already die in the sexually mature girl and boy, in the ego and its responsibility which now emerges? The mother feels this when the shadow of her son's first beard tickles and prickles. The adolescent himself feels it when life ceases to be a game, when small things and hiding places become inaccessible to his growing body. And melancholy is in fact customary during the transition into the first stage of manhood, where the good old student days vanish, and bourgeoisement begins. But the cesura of old age is clearer than earlier cesura, and more brutally, brutally negative. Loss itself seems to become concentrated. Virility decreases. Fertility ceases entirely. The luster disappears. The summer ends. And if the aging man does not notice himself that he is growing old, then the others notice it. He sees the cause by the effect, no matter how young he is urged to feel. It is very instructive for most old men when a girl stands up to make room for them for the first time. This politeness certainly does not act as a plus which age has brought. It has a fatal effect. 
and even the old fop who usually tries to deceive himself by being superficial, the easiest gift of youth, is surprised by the realization of how short life is. Something long since past can seem as close in old age as distant mountains shortly before the rain. The realization is received almost with disbelief, even by the dignified old man. It seems only yesterday that he was the same age as the young people around him. Doubtless, therefore, the specific feeling of age which sets in around fifty, sometimes even earlier, is little prepared for by the previously experienced and yet never so sharply experienced changing stages of life is seen with some justification as something unfamiliar. The reason lies in the unclear nature or in the unclarified nature of the benefits which old age brings for all the brutal negative aspects which can be associated with it and ultimately are associated with it. Thus the handshake of old age is predominantly only felt to be one of farewell, that is, with death at the sharp end, the latter possible at any stage of life, but inevitable in greater age, no longer gives the ebb and any prospect of experiencing a flow. And that makes the change called old age so decisive. It makes it so unmistakable in contrast to the earlier stages concealed beneath new foliage just as if the pain of farewell which the adolescent, the man, may have felt, or equally may not have felt, on leaving childhood and youth, were retrieved here and added to one's own autumn. Thus an old age which is not petty also manifests wishes to return to a youth which there and then, years ago, may well have been felt as something that was still deficient, namely as intangible blossom and not yet as tangible, clearly defined fruit ripe for weighing. Precisely an old man who works, who is therefore not sucking at the paws of memory in his winter cave, will at least wish back all the time he had before him at the age of twenty. He will wish back the magic of the long backgrounds which life possessed for him, then, and which, as the future decreases, as the years are numbered, certainly decreases too. Thus resignation, which is only half genuine and temporary in youth, exists as genuine and collected in normal age. No mere for farewell to a phase of life is marked here, with dispersing dreams, thwarted fulfillments, but farewell to long life itself. It nevertheless remains strange that an oppressive sense of aging can emerge so strongly, and characteristically it does not emerge with equal force, nor so uninhibitedly in all men, nor in all periods of history. Instead, a psychological vacuum must also accompany the organic ebb, or at least, as noted above, the unclear or unclarified nature of the benefits which old age brings. Thus, to sum up, we may say, to make old age pure suffering, provided it is relatively healthy and based on an efficient life, all that is necessary is a simpleton to experience it in a late bourgeois society which desperately dolls itself up to look young. There's a proverb, when the candle's out, you can tell whether it was wax or tallow. So old age is not itself at fault, if the figure which it raises out of illusion and appearance is still just an ugly one. In societies which, unlike today's declining bourgeois society, did not shy away from every glimpse of the end, possessed and saw in old age a blossoming fruit, a very desirable and welcome one. So it was in the Spartan Council of Elders, in the Senate in still Republican Rome, even in the new dimension of socialist experience. A different destiny to that of declining is still always to be heard here, has remained considerably more than honor in the ori head. For a thriving society does not fear like a declining one its reflected image in old age, but greets there its watchman. On the whole, old age shows, like every earlier stage of life, completely possible specific benefits which also compensate for the farewell to the previous stage of life. Thus growing old not only describes a desirable stretch of time in which as much as possible has been experienced, and in which as much as possible can be learnt on the way out. Growing old can also describe a wishful image. According to the situation, the wishful image oops, uh, the wishful image of commanding view or possibly of harvest Voltaire says in the same vein, for the ignorant old age is like the winter, 
for the educated it is gathering and pressing the grapes. This does not exclude youth, but includes it in the after-ripening. The wish to return to youth loses precisely its element of suffering thanks to this matured empathy with what is coming. It compensates, fulfills itself with the footing it has gained, with simplicity and meaning. In general, a person's later years will thus contain all the more youth, in the unimitated sense, the more collection there already was to start with in his youth. The phases of life, and therefore also old age, then lose their isolated sharpness. The healthy, wishful image of old age, and in old age, is that of thoroughly formed maturity. It feels more at home giving than taking. Evening in House To be able to be so collected means there must be no noise. A final wish permeates all the wishes of old age, an often not unquestionable one for rest. It can be just as tormenting, even as hungry as the earlier pursuit of diversion. The sexual flaring up, which especially in women is often reminiscent of early puberty, is also dampened by it. Even the possibility, or even the possibly productive nature related, to clo related so closely to youth, so familiar with it, needs freedom from disturbance more than before, or even more freedom from disturbance. And every old man wishes to be allowed to be exhausted by life, even if he is caught up in the hurly-burly of the world. A part of him behaves as if he were not caught up in it. Vanity is the last garment that man removes, but only a very strange old man will give this garment a lot of hard wear at the expense of silence. The image of this silence is wonderfully embellished, precisely in the non-embourgeoisement of old age. The image of the country instead of the city. The, elap the elaption where the wet clothes are drying, where things are not very busy. In more important cases, the wish for rest subdues even the, gr the regret over previous omissions and mistakes. In his old age, failures in his life seem to go with almost unimportant in the long run, where they had not turned out well. Happiness refused, and particularly work unfinished, still rankle, but in memory the latter at least, rightly or wrongly, almost takes shape. Jacob Grimm's speech about old age, which he himself gave in his 75th year, throws light on all these friendly late wishes and late feelings. This speech, definitely more Nolan's than Volan's, is sustained by the grateful awareness that growing old is a blessing. Physical debilities of the senses are mitigated here in the general wish for rest. They even supplement its content. Even possible deafness, according to Grimm, has the advantage that superfluous talk, useless chatter can no longer interrupt us. Failing eyesight causes many disturbing details to disappear. Grimm recalls the blind seer and he describes the enjoyment which the solitary walk affords the old man, how feeling for nature is heightened in general. Man is alone with himself in nature. The chattering conversation of nutrient plants dies down. The world grows dark in the evening, but the water grows bright. The last drop of life is dedicated to contemplation. Past deprivation is no longer felt. Past happiness is becalmed, renewed through memory. The chisel blows of life have worked an essential shape, and what is essential can be seen by it better than ever before. Nevertheless, of course, even this kind of separation from other stages of life, emphasized by the wish for rest and a kind of strolling standstill, is different in different periods. The Biedermeer period is long past where the old soul, even in much less pure forms than that of Jacob Grimm, repaired to its own breast and was served at the long table dote of memories. The late capitalist world is certainly not a bank of good hope for old people. Even the winter rest of the middle class is seriously disturbed by the dwindling or the precariousness of the savings account. Only socialist society can fulfill the wishes of old age for leisure. Yet even here, this leisure, in a positive sense of course, is different to before, since the difference between the generations is no longer so sharply divisive. Life at the moment is much more sharply delineated politically, and it can no longer be said that old age, despite its reflectiveness, is simple reaction, simply reactionary youth, despite its freshness, simply progressive. 
Often it is the other way around, and the wish of old age for rest in a time where, to isolate one symptom, there are still fascist youth leagues with their heads thrown back, does not always coincide with the wish of old age to remain forever in the inertia of yesterday. It has become easier than ever for old age to burn at both ends, namely with courage and experience together, with new consciousness and with that of the known inheritance. The man who has grown old and who, sitting in the cool of evening on the bench outside his front door, turns over the pages of his spent life and nothing more. This feature of Grimm's wishful image has gone out of circulation economically and in terms of content. Still in circulation, however, is the vigorous wish, so commensurate with the wish for silence, that the empty whirl of life round about should stop. Precisely love as silence can be more remote from the capitalist scramble than a youth, which mistakes the scramble for life. Here old age, for which the bourgeois world no longer has any use, has the right to be old-fashioned, to be genteel, giving a lead, using words and casting commanding glances which are not of that day, nor for that day. Embodying times in which as yet not everything was the bustle of commerce, and above all in which this bustle will cease again. This makes a striking and yet understandable connection possible for many an old man today, provided he has grown wise with a new age, the age without the cocky, sharp, heel-clicking wolves, i.e. the socialist age. Wish and ability to be without vulgar haste, to see what is important, to forget what is unimportant. All this is authentic life in old age.